I mean, other than that, a lot of it just tried way too hard to be funny. I mean, her kicking up the door. You know, who does that? The whole thing in the nightmare with the ear and the pin dropping, it's just weird. And then his fucking head blows up because of the noise. Okay, Johnny Depp can totally pull off doing a this is your brain on drugs ad, but it was still pretty silly. Oh no, a hole. I guess I'll just let you fall in, Spencer. That was not cut. She was standing in front of them, then suddenly she's trying hours later by herself or something. Yeah, we get it. It's not John. It's really her. You know, it was kind of a giveaway when you told us the year the child was removed. The line, every town has an Elm Street, wasn't bad. You know, it has that kind of vibe of it could happen anywhere. But in the first movie, that was subliminal. Here, it's just spelled. I mean, that was always Wes Craven's idea, this could happen anywhere. The town, the first one, I'm pretty sure it wasn't called Springwood. It was just some American town. You know, letting us know, making us think that this could happen anywhere. This could happen to you, the audience. You know, what is it with these horror sequels telling us, no, it's only this specific group of people that are going to get killed, that are targets? It just makes it more boring and less mysterious. I guess the explanation was decent, even though it did kind of seem like he was killing children even before they took his away. But we really should know why he does this. When a killer's motives are vague, mysterious, undefined, it seems like he could strike anywhere in it. The moment you say, oh, it was because of this, it just takes away from the terror of it. Stop fighting Kruger or versions of him with martial arts. The dream people, the ones who gave me this job, are you fucking kidding me? The bit with her being supplied weapons is really stupid, and I'm sorry, wasn't that just a regular pipe bomb? Is his chest made of foam? I mean, how the fuck did she plunge it in there like that? It didn't seem to be one of the places she had stabbed him. Finally, someone thinks of grabbing him and pulling him out of the dream again, like in the first one. And finally, Wes Craven's new nightmare, aptly titled. I really like this film. It's the closest thing to a good sequel to the original. And no, I don't think there should be any sequels to the original, but this is a genuinely good movie. It is not for everyone. It's kind of meta, and it's about the making of the film that we're watching, sort of. It's also worth noting that it's not really an, a Nightmare on Elm Street film, hence the title. And this is not the Freddy Krueger we've come to know, which we shouldn't, over the last six films. It's, it's something different. Darker. Yeah, who'd have thought that could happen? He was pretty fucking dark in the first one. More evil and less vain. He does still have occasional one-liners, but this being a completely new one, he's mysterious all over again and he gradually gets built up, just like in the first one. This also establishes an atmosphere. It's a very suspenseful, creepy, and intense film. It may very well be the least gory of all seven, but it does have a good deal of blood. This isn't really for fans of the series, or for people who like that it is a series. You don't have to have watched any of the sequels to enjoy this one. You can just watch the first one and then this one. Though it might be good if you know the basic image Freddy has, but who doesn't? I mean, I knew it before I watched any of these. Early on, this makes fun of the image that Freddy had before this film, by the time of this film but without it losing the seriousness. It's no longer really campy. The acting varies a tad, but I think the important roles are performed well. Langenkamp and Saxon return. Craven pushed, so does a couple of other people. The basic concept is that Langenkamp is just living a normal life now. And this is her. This is not her character of the first film, Nancy Thompson. She has a boyfriend or husband, something like that, and they have a son together. But she starts having nightmares, and it seems like it might be Freddy. The kid is very creepy, if at times also annoying. He's good at being the kind of creepy where you're not sure if it's evil 
or innocent. There are a couple of callbacks to the first one, and without it being silly or too on the nose, the new Freddy design is fucking terrifying. The finale is quite good, very intense, and the eerie score is very effective. This is a reflective sort of film, and it comments on censorship, which is why it's pretty fitting that this is like one of the only Wes Craven films where he actually got fine. And finally, spoilers. I really like the callback in the beginning. The hand is awesome. Maybe it's just me, but didn't it at one point look like there were two of them? I love how he has that scratch when he wakes up, and it's so small that maybe it wasn't a nightmare, but just maybe it was. And the claw scratches along the wall that may just be the earthquake, but maybe something else. I know others have said this before me, but Langenkamp is fucking hot in this movie. I really like the line, I don't know why you like these fairy tales. You know, and she realizes how gruesome this children's literature. You know, it goes into how these things help us, how we need to admit that there are aspects that are evil, that are ugly. And the thing with the witch wanting to eat the children is, is a lot like the ending where he tries to fit the kid's head into his mouth. And damn near succeeds. We again get the claws between the legs, the very vulnerable position, and again people are dying, and I found myself caring about it. Well, that could be taken out of context. Do you have to die to see God? No, I don't think so. Some women apparently see him when they have really great sex. The exchange about, can you come with me in my dreams, I think that only happens in the movies, that was a perfect line on 3 and 4. Then again, it does wind up happening in this movie too. I like the voyeuristic camera on England, and I love how meta it is that we see the script on the screen right after we've heard that dialogue, and then it fades to black just like we see it. This time, staying awake won't save you. This makes Freddy scary again, and it can also be pretty funny at times without taking away from the overall tone. I like how this says that if we don't let it out through creative expression, our impulses, our urges, will still hurt us. And in worse ways. You know, because he hasn't made a nightmare movie in 10 years, Freddy comes back. Because it hasn't gotten released in the safe way. And this also makes us think, you know, it's not a movie. All of her dreams are coming true. And not in the usual hopeful meaning of that saying. In this one, you don't quite know what's real and what isn't. You know, we have dreams within dreams. And we don't know this Freddy, we don't know what his limitations might be. I really like Julie scaring the nurse with the syringe. Do you know what's in this? Do you know what'll happen when I stab you with it? And I will. Yeah! Okay, granted, this had someone putting someone stalked by Freddy to sleep too, but it worked. It wasn't overused. I think it also just has to do with the tone. If the film really works, that sort of thing can work. I'm honestly not entirely sure what Freddy did to Julie up on the ceiling. I mean, he killed her, I'm just not sure what he did to do it, other than the stabbing, but I love the setup and payoff of right across the freeway. You know, at first it sounds so safe, and then when it comes right down to it, it absolutely isn't. Her going into the wicked world is very claustrophobic. Has anybody else noticed that this is the first movie where this child killer is actually seen trying to kill an actual child. I mean, not counting the unborn baby of the fifth movie. Other than the claw thing, this plays on a couple of other instinctive fears, like the snakes and the idea of being eaten. The conclusion was pretty fitting and big and exciting. I wouldn't have thought something like that would work for this kind of film, but it really did. I think it's kind of cool that in the entire series we never see him be burnt by the parents. I mean, for all that they did flashback to, that was never one of them. The trailer on the DVD is excellent, by the way. And this has 11 nightmares in the Jump to a Nightmare feature. Anyway, that was the entire Nightmare on Elm Street series. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, sweet dreams.